Michael Eccles is the CEO of a Kennedy Space Center based non for profit called IACI and CEO of a for profit company founded called Mac Cybersecurity, located in Washington, D.C. Mr. Eccles spent seven years in critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity leadership at the Department of Homeland Security, DHS. He has led several White House national security initiatives before resigning his position in September 2016. In addition, recently Michael released a book called Secure Cyber Life The Government is Not Coming to Save You, with intention to assist everyday people and businesses to understand why cybersecurity should matter to them. We discuss current events, cyber risk, as well as what the COVID-19 means to the future of privacy. Uh, maybe you can give us an, a, just a kind of a brief overview of, um, or maybe not so brief, you've done a lot. So maybe you can give us an idea of uh, who you are, you know, what was your you know, career path, and, um, and then kind of fast forward to today and what you're doing. You're involved in a lot of different things today. So if you don't mind, just kind of give us a, uh, a quick review. Sure. So, sure. so um, I had a long history of telecommunications and uh, cybersecurity going back to when we were tracking people stealing uh, the phone cards. Uh, and over a period of time, uh, developed a cyber acumen. And 9-11 hit. Uh, went to work for TSA. And uh, working at TSA, I was able to help them solve the inter interoperability problem. You know, during 9-11, firefighters couldn't talk to police. And uh, I did this in an experiment at the 2004 Super Bowl prior to having smartphones. And what's fascinating about that is we didn't even have smartphones at that point, 2004. Uh, I helped build the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, uh, and that's the 16 critical sectors. It includes things like health, uh, energy, uh, agriculture, uh, food and ag, those types of things. And these are sectors that are critical to uh, us surviving with the life that we currently like living. Uh, from there, uh, I began to lead uh, at an organization called the National uh, Communication System. This is an organization that was a little known that uh, was first under DOD and then with the Department of Homeland Security. And we assured decision makers could communicate. What does that mean? Underwater sea cables, satellite, unseen networks. Um, and uh, we had direct connection to CEOs from the major telecommunications companies so that we could restore communications during a disaster. Uh, as I moved on through my career, I had the opportunity to help build in this cybersecurity framework. Uh, I was responsible for the rollout of an information sharing strategy um, that we created with the White House in 2015. And I've been the representative to NATO uh, for communications and cyber. So really interesting. So your career went from almost like, you know, physical security, um, you know, to cybersecurity. And you've seen the entire gamut. I mean, a lot of things have changed in the past, you know, 20 years. Um, and recently you, uh, you put together, basically you wrote a book, um, uh, talking about specifically about, um, you know, cybersecurity preparedness and then, you know, kind of talk about the fact that we, the government, uh, is not going to save us, um, you know, if, if a cyber incident happened. So that is intriguing because, um, mainly because of what's going on today and we you know prior to this call in our conversation we discussed the fact that you know there are you know several similarities in terms of how how the government is currently um you know assisting or trying to mitigate the COVID 19 uh you know damage uh, and basically um you know we can kind of relate to that and kind of extrapolate in terms of the action that they're, they're taking now uh, to uh, to assist with with the pandemic, and we can extrapolate that to potentially what's going to happen if uh, you know if, if a major cybersecurity attack uh, would hit the U.S. Um, so maybe uh, maybe you can kind of give us a you know kind of your, your thoughts in the matter, um, you know what you experienced so far uh, in terms of COVID nineteen, what you see, and then also like what are your thoughts around you know, where, where the similarities are. And then, you know, maybe like uh, the tail end is like, 
you, you know, how how do people that kind of see the situation right now can can deduct from it what the action would be for for uh, you know for a cybersecurity incident? That'd be great. Sure. So I was high enough on the food chain at the Department of Homeland Security, where when the last pandemic came about, um, it's not just health professionals that come together. It's uh, professionals across communications. When we talk about telework, we're looking at that from a national level. Um, we're looking at the systems in place to do the testing that's required, the security of the research facilities. There are so many things that go into it that you don't see now on television. But over a period of time with the election hacking, um, with uh, the politics bleeding into the security, uh, and uh, just as an aside, NATO not defining what a cyber attack is, because if they define what a cyber attack is, uh, a cyber war, then we would all be at war because we're attacking each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing these types of things occur and it becomes clear to me that number one, the government can't protect its own systems, right? They work very hard to do it. Um, part of the uh, requirement uh, on government is that they assist to protect the dot com. They protect the dot gov. And we say assist because we're a free country. Uh, when I used to go to the NATO meetings, there were a couple of countries that would come there and they would kind of chuckle about public private partnership because their government made all the decisions. So on one hand, we're very lucky that we have the freedoms to decide what kind of software we use, whether we apply certain uh, securities uh, to our systems. But on the other hand, that mismatch of approaches is what creates the seams that makes us vulnerable. So we as a free society will always be vulnerable. With that said, and you compare it to COVID, this idea that people have to make a decision as to whether they social distance or whether the government tells them that they can go out or go back to work and all those types of things. But there is a freedom of choice, right? We have that same freedom of choice with our security of systems and networks and assets, which in both cases affect other people. One of the things that I uh, constantly say in my speeches is that cybersecurity is just a buzzword. It's the amalgamation of the training, the firewalls, the threat hunting, all the pieces that go into protecting an environment. What it really is, is risk management. And we know risk as vulnerabilities threats and consequences. And so as you try to explain this to people, just like you're trying to explain the COVID, that it's about how quickly it spreads, or it's about the consequences of somebody dying in two weeks and those kinds of things. As you ex try to explain cyber security to people, it's that if you're not actually understanding what the vulnerabilities are, you don't know what your threats are and you have no idea what the consequences are that you're not applying systems or applications to figure that out then you're not doing cybersecurity. Right. You, you know it's interesting about you know what you mentioned at the beginning about the definition of you know what the cyber war is right the definition so that's also kind of came about you know how long it took the government to define it this is a pandemic or you know mm -hmm. for COVID-19 and that goes back to what I was saying about I could clearly see where politics had inserted themselves into our national security or to our individual security now that we all walk around with a computer in our hand. Right. So so yeah, there's a lot of similarities there. And what can we deduct from you know from the action that's being taken right now in the past, you know, several months? You know, to potentially what the government and how the government will operate, and 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 uh, you know, after a potential uh, you know cyber event. So what? on a broader scale, uh, as I traveled around giving speeches, it became clear to me that even some cyber professionals that I was talking to 
outside of the DC area had these ideas about things that government was doing to protect them that aren't true. They, there are people that believe that there's some kind of magical firewall, right? Or there are some kind of processes that are going on across all of the telecoms and the IPs, and it at least protects them 75 to 80%. So that's not the And case. I kind of deduced that we've got a problem here. And so part of the genesis of the book was to help people understand the big picture. And the big picture is we're being attacked every day, all the time, never stops. And then I took that into helping them understand, well, what is the government doing? And then the next piece to that is, oh, by the way, private companies that you love and trust are doing the same thing to you that hackers are doing using the same processes. And the reason that Congress hasn't acted is because, oh, by the way, those same companies fund those congressional campaigns, right? So we've got a very interesting uh, cycle going on here, which leaves the weakest of us most vulnerable. And so this book was to help people who know nothing else about cybersecurity understand the big picture, what's going on with government, the threats to them, and even where technology is going and how as technology goes there and we surrender ourselves through apps, through other um, systems that we quit pro quo, right? We give our data and information and they allow us a certain capability. Essentially, we become digital slaves at some point. Yeah, I think so, one of the things you mentioned- And let me just add to that, that yeah. what, happens when, what happens when you are defined by algorithm, right? So David is now an algorithm, which is what your social security number used to be, but they're corrupted now, right? So you are an algorithm. What happens when that becomes corrupted? Do we end up with one of these future societies that we see on TV where some people cannot, they don't have the money, they don't have the wherewithal, they don't have the representation. They are no longer a part of society. Three or four years ago, that would have sounded absolutely ridiculous. Right now, that's the path that we're on. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because uh, you, you mentioned there's no free lunch, right? I think in, in the mm -hmm. book, it's, and so we we always give something which is our privacy and a lot of people are saying hey you know i have nothing to hide so why do i care i've heard i've heard that a lot any you know any thoughts about well, you that? know what i tell them i tell them right away last summer new york passed a bill that allows insurance companies to get information from social media i tell them that a little less than a year ago facebook was trying to connect with major banks so they could exchange information and all of this starts to add up because four years from now, when you were, or right now, you're looking uh, at for something online for a friend. Four years from now, you go to get insurance and they're checking you for the thing that you were looking for online four years previously. Uh, I think people underestimate the technology and the corporations that are being formed around nothing but data, right? So it does matter. So do you have that <clears throat> that bracelet that says, you know, in case of death, just delete my Google search history? <laughs> do you have one of those? I should Not yet. That. You know, that's probably, you know, because I think the search engines probably know more about you than your spouse. I mean, it's just that's uh, right. It's just uh, you know clear. And <clears throat> coming back about n not having an invisible aid or or guard, uh, you know, there's also this joke where you know, oh, you know, I lost my, uh, you know, my my uh, my laptop, you know, got you know something got wiped out, and oh, don't worry, the NSA has a copy, you know, that's they right. back up all this. So. So it's not, there's no such thing. I mean, I guess that's, it's just, uh, you know, that's just. No, they, rumors. They, there are all kinds of programs that were formed after 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. And we were all willing to go along with it for the security of the nation. Well, 
guess what? When we talked about privacy earlier, there are all kinds of systems and exceptions being provided right now. Uh, the blue dot, they are looking to see who is at a certain beach at a certain time and eight hours later, where did those people disperse to? Now that's great because for public health, we all want to understand how the potential uh, disease is being spread so that we can contain it. Great. How do you put it back in the box? Uh, Google and Facebook are actually working together or Google and Apple, I believe, to create a system that they'll be rolling out shortly for tracing and tracking. How do you put that back in the box after we get past this? Well, I think that's also true with what happens after September 11th, right? A lot of the um, regulatory and, and uh, you know conditions and you know for travel and so on were put put in place, and that never went away. You know, so I think there's a lot of civil liberties that kind of like were you know were put to the side, and I think that's also true now because again, if you start measuring somebody's temperature or heartbeat, I mean, then that can also implies you know hey you know i'm excited or you know it, it can tell a lot about a person from, sure. from measuring that and aside from and it's a completely outside of the scope of of detecting whether they're sick or not you know just you know they even been you know seeing a uh, an advertisement and now they know if you you know your heartbeat goes up so maybe like now they know that the it has an, an effect on you so that's that's uh, so it, what's going on with these plans and, and is there anybody that that you know is questioning it or or is yeah. it like the the you know the um the saying that you know don't get don't let a crisis go to waste is that is that that's something right. that's applicable here uh this particular crisis is being exploited financially and uh across the board uh for use cases totally understandable that employers are worried about people coming back into their work environment and then there being some type of litigious activities uh because someone gets sick well, in that same regard, I was just on a call earlier where we were looking at um, cameras that will not only take your temperature, but those thermal cameras will also track you to understand who you came in contact with, All right? And so this idea of cyber physical is real and it's now. Um, most of the cyber exercises I do, for instance, uh, are looking at cyber physical because when there is a cyber activity in this ever increasing digital world a physical thing occurs uh, in the simplest form if somebody hacks into a system and they turn one little uh take a one out or a zero out and all of a sudden the gates open and the gates stay open right well that type of thing is our reality and the people have not progressed and matured in their understanding of it as fast as, as the technology has moved. Like this fast moving technology is actually making us comfortable. Yeah, you know, I, I and you know, question I, things less. Yeah, you know, I've seen I've seen uh, videos of the drones, uh, in a crest from you know New York City, basically asking, announcing, uh, you know, uh, social distancing. I mean, that that was pretty surreal to 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 see that they've they've adopted, uh, you know, drones. Um, now these drones are now taking videos and and they can detect, you know, if somebody's not social distancing. And then I also think that they um, uh, they they had a hotline. Basically, we can kind of like grab people that are uh you know uh take you know send photos whatever and and i think that instead of sending yeah you can rat your friends out yeah. if you can rat people out who weren't social distancing yeah and i think that kind of backfired i think that they received a lot of you know on call for uh photos of of certain body, body parts instead um so that's <laughs> <laughs> that kind of backfired. Um, so, so tell me, like, you know, what do you see right now, like, with, you know, um, you know, with COVID nineteen and and what's going on with, like, you know, everybody had basically transformed into digital almost overnight. Um, you know, have you seen any increase in, um, you know, attacks? Is like, have you seen like, um, 
you know, enterprise and government looking to to mitigate or, or looking for, uh, you know, worst case scenarios in terms of what happens next, because there's a lot of things that are happening, I think, that we're not seeing uh, essentially in the, in the mainstream media. Yeah, so uh, it's really interesting and not um, surprising that the attacks, uh, the phishing emails, and even the attacks on hospitals and medical systems have gone up by like 280%. It's a, it's a noticeable change in difference. And it is also interesting that a lot of our critical infrastructures where people are forced to work from home and they're not actual, actually physical people standing in front of systems and focused on systems, um, we're worried that they're being set up uh, when we turn things back on at a minimum, the last thing that uh, employees who you spent tons of money training, the last thing they're going to be thinking about when they come into work is cybersecurity, right? When you talk about basic things like sharing passwords and um, letting people into uh, spaces that they shouldn't be in or remembering what a um, phishing email looks like or any of those kinds of things, um, that's going, it seems like the smallest thing that people need to worry about, but it's the biggest thing that they will need to worry about because all the focus will be on temperature taking. All the focus will be on social distancing, right? And it's these types of scenes and these types of distractions is what allows um, the exploitation to take place, right? And so this increase that we've seen in hacking and all types of exploits is only going to keep increasing. Uh, I recently did a, a video uh, trying to get Congress to think about increasing funding for IT security in the next um, stimulus bill, because we've already seen where HHS was attacked. Uh, the Illinois Health What's Department just, website just was attacked. With the acronym, uh, Michael, what's the HHS again? Uh, Health and Human Services. Okay. And so a lot, <laughs> something that's really interesting is the last thing that biological researchers think about is cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. They are probably one of the greatest targets right now. And so you meld all this together and then the idea that people are working from home in environments and on networks where they're doing work with sensitive information and it's on the same network as their kid who is on Xbox. Those, those exploits have gone up in a ridiculous way. Um, but they're on the same ne network as Xbox and all kind of other um, different practices that you do when you're at home as opposed to uh, at a job site, smart TV and all those types of things. Uh, it's just a recipe for uh, a lot of cyber intrusion. And what I will say to all that is, and this is where the book goes, is hackers are evolving in a way that we're not. So they get into the system and just hang out and wait for opportunity. And so uh, this hiatus from the workplace that millions and millions of people have now is allowing um, organized criminals to get into these places and just hang out. Mm -hmm. And in the majority of employees, um, you know, they're not in cybersecurity. They will almost have no uh, visibility into what's happening on the network. And we relax requirements for uh, cyber requirements that are pretty much every professional workplace is created. As soon as you need to get people to work remotely, you relax with some. Yeah, I mean, you can't control, you know, people bring in their control. laptops and, and, you know, the kids probably, you know, install games or play web games on their laptops or surf. I mean, it just... It's 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 bound to happen. So I have a question here uh, for Noah, uh, Michael. If I'm understanding correctly, you're implying that the civil liberties 
that we'll need to give up to combat COVID will ultimately be irre irreversible. Is there any way you can visualize that uh, this allowance will actually be temporary and not permanent? Can you think of any protocols that would meaningfully restrict or prevent permanent increase in intrusiveness? That's a good question. Um, actually, I can't because, again, it's political. There are not a bunch of cyber people sitting around the table developing protocols for what's best for the nation. And what I will harken back to is 2016, um, after the election, we all know that there was interference with the election. You would think that there would be an explosion of activity to protect our systems because the elections are a hallmark. They're a leg on the stool of democracy. But the White House got rid of the first federal CISO and that person brought things together. So knowing that that is the approach, I don't see the type of leadership that's going to bring together um, what they used to call graybeards to come up with the proper level of privacy versus what we allow versus uh, corporate uh, access. Because to be totally honest with you, corporate access has become corporate malfeasance. Because the only thing that holds anybody back is where's the line? Well, it used to be a gray line. If there is no line, then are corporations who are trying to make money doing anything wrong? Yeah, and we, you know, we are, and especially now, we are a knowledge-based economy. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of money in just knowing, you know, processes in place. I mean, think about a restaurant, restaurant, and maybe a restaurant's not probably not a good example right now, but you know, a restaurant um, value add is and how they train their employees, how they, you know, the um, greet customers and you know how they train their staff and what the recipes are that's basically the value add and, and if you get into that uh they basically you can easily replicate that and that also includes ip and so on so all of that is now exposed because people are you know working from home and no longer are behind you know the, the firewalls or the you know the ips uh, ids of, of uh, enterprise system um so what would you recommend if if you could uh, recommend uh, you know and we talk about also the the smbs and the small medium sized businesses in the us that they're completely ill you know ill prepared to um you know to to deal with any any types of of uh you know cybersecurity risk and they're you know they're kind of the backbones of the economy um, what do you see there? And I know that you address some of that in uh, in your book as well. You know, in terms of like how to how to you know bring in the main you know some some risks associated with that. Sure. So one of the things that shuts most small businesses down is when you say the word cybersecurity, they have no clue what that means. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about risk management, hmm, they go okay because typically we've all had insurance throughout our whole lives, and insurance is based based on risk, right? And we do certain things to lower risk, like driving within a certain speed limit, uh, paying attention for the road, not having a radio, but so loud, those types of things, wearing our seatbelt. And so those are practices that people understand. And so for cybersecurity, for us to even get started as a society, in the same way that they've told us with COVID, social distance, you know, wash your hands, those types of um tangible practices apply to cybersecurity. And so I found that when you present them to SMBs and others, they tend to get it. But there are some issues that are more global in nature that they all face. For instance, uh, when you use public Wi-Fi, even when you're using a VPN, you're still vulnerable, right? And so understanding that there are certain things you would not do over public Wi-Fi. Of course, we all have to use public Wi-Fi sometime, right? When we were in the airport, your boss calls you, he tells you he needs a document, those types of things. But we just have to practice risk management to assure that if we are exploited digitally, that the consequences will be lower. 
It makes total sense. So what's your so what's your day to day uh, day uh, look like for, for you since the COVID nineteen and maybe maybe like do you see any you know, positive because uh, you know, we talk about a lot of negatives. Talk about a lot of negatives. Do you see any um, positive outcome from having you know the situation? Sure, absolutely. From a technology standpoint, innovation is at an all-time high. I love innovation, problem solving. Um, the key is we always build security in after the fact, right? So the processes of trying to figure out how to do better security for all of these remote workers that is not leading the pack you know um, the technology that's going on all over the place relates to better communication better video communication because it's all about performance um you know i like to say that uh, in most cases when uh security goes up convenience goes down. When convenience goes up, security goes down. And so at some point um, during this process, wow, wouldn't it be great if they just, like they went up together, right? But security often slows time to market. And that's the problem. We live in a capitalistic society. So it's almost like we have to accept certain losses. Right. And, and it's interesting because we've been having this conversation about COVID. It's almost like we're hearing the same thing. If we want our economic um, uh, world to be as it was, we're going to have to accept some loss. Well, that's exactly the same thing they say about IT security and IT systems. Right. There's always going to be a leak. There's always going to be a hole. There's always going to be a loser. Right. And so you're just trying not to be that loser or in the case of COVID, the person that loses their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always a seems to be a trade off. That's that's heavy, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I think this I don't know if there's still an echo for me, but I'll, I'll try to make it short. Um, so so uh, maybe the last couple of things to wrap up. You mentioned uh, specifically. You mentioned, uh, I don't know if it's still echoing here. Um, you talk about information security for hackers, and uh, you know national wealth, and this is a company that legally doing that. And you mentioned like Facebook, is a big company, but isn't it um, something that is actually going to eventually uh, bite them back because people are you know, potentially just they're gonna just revolt against it and not use the service that all people for example stop using Well so that's that's the genesis of the book is people aren't gonna revolt against something that they are unaware of. Most people have no awareness of anything, right? And all I wanted to do was pull the curtain back and to say this is how things occur. If you choose to buy an Alexa, you need to understand that it's listening to you when you don't know that it's listening to you. Right. You need to go and read the reviews about technology from other people. Right. You need to understand that as you're reading this article for 15 minutes, a hacker is spending 18 hours a day trying to figure out how to beat that system. Right. And so it's an awareness thing. We all have that's the beauty of living in this country. We all have the gift of choice about so many things and it's about making those choices that protect you and your family and a great part of that is understanding the consequences and that's the piece that the government does a very poor job of is helping people understand if you do x potentially y will occur So do you do you feel that the, there's a government co collaboration um, between government and industry in terms of yeah they're not coming to, to help the you know the big well the, the small you know the citizens and SMBs but it seems to are willing to help for example the large enterprise even now you see them financially helping the large enterprise 
Is yeah. there something that's happening also in the cyberspace where they? they sure. So I have to say, when I was at Homeland Security, I ran a lot of the partnership programs. Uh, I dealt with on a daily basis everybody from Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman to um, the, all the big banks to the electrical uh, and power generation companies. You know, after a while, you know all these people. Um, from CEOs to the head of cybersecurity, you know them by face and by name. So that's the only way we survive is because there is that coordination and because they are working together. But the point is that the government, if you just look at the evidence, NSA has been hacked, tools were stolen, DHS has been hacked a thousand, TSA has been hacked, um, CIA has been hacked. I mean, if somebody can hack CIA, then what what opportunity do you have to really protect yourself if they really wanted to get to you? And so the, the point is that they're spending a lot of time trying to protect themselves, which ultimately protects you. At the same time, there is a um, thought across government that everyone bears a personal responsibility, companies, bear a personal responsibility, but that message has not been put out, right? So it's like there's an elephant in the room and no one's saying it. Also, um, from a corporate standpoint and from, uh, from the, the idea of looking at um, how you do better cybersecurity, it's clear from my study that everyone doing cybersecurity forgets about the people. They forget that humans will do things based on our human condition and not based on their training. And the human ultimately becomes the weak link. And I'll give you an example of that. One of them could be a human going on social media. Did you know that there was a Facebook group, right? And it was a group of national security officials. And it was actually um, somebody spoofing their identity and getting information based best because they cozied up to these national security officials who should have known better than being a Facebook Facebook group. Additionally, they used to do a thing where they throw USBs out in the parking lot just to test and to see if someone will pick it up and put it in the system um, because they've just been trained, do not put a stray USB in our system. Now what they will do is take that same USB, sit it on a conference room table less than a week after everyone had the training, right? People will pick that USB up, stick it into the system, and when they ask that person, why would you do this? You're an intelligent person. You just received training. The person ultimately says, I just wanted to return it to the rightful owner. So good people will do good things, right? It's a part of our human condition. And those types of things have to be built into your security planning because if you don't do that, you are simply creating a plan. You're not actually developing security that works. Isn't it a saying, uh, you know, the road to hell leads... Um is uh you know pay for good intentions i mean that's the person basically what it is doing and i'm sure if it has uh, you know the word payroll on it on the uh, you know <laughs> curiosity it's it's one of those things you just can't can't avoid uh and then we also talk about briefly is about you know what's the, what is the concept of asking one more question it came out uh, you know i had chris roberts on my one of my live events and um he mentioned you know ask one more question you know, what's that concept uh, look like for you? And what would you recommend, you know, people uh, to do? So, you know, that idea of asking one more question is powerful. But let's think about it. It, it creates almost like a two-factor authentication or a multi-factor authentication, right? Because you're now potentially asking a question that whoever it is on the other end can't answer. Or you're asking a question to jog your human condition. But I'll give you one that's more tangible. Um, something that's really big right now is SIM swapping. 
And what SIM swapping is, is uh, most phones have a SIM card with an identification for that device. And what will happen is there's an FCC rule that allows porting for you to go from one carrier, AT&T, for instance, to Verizon. And all a person has to do is convince, have enough information from previous breaches or from data they bought online to convince the person who is taking the application and customer service at one of these organizations that you are who you say you are. At the point in which they switch you over to the new service, they are switching you over onto the hacker's device. The person that actually owned the phone number and uh, the system related to that phone, they no longer have access. So you say, well, still, they still don't have access to any of your information. Okay. From the previous breaches, they know what your logon IDs are. They go in, they say lost password. It sends the code to your phone that they now have, and they change the passwords. So outside of them being able to get into all of your systems, including banking and other types of uh, sensitive systems, they also lock you out. Uh, this type of ingenuity this type of thinking is prevalent across the hacker community now and this idea of cyber information sharing and um it is prevalent i mean they don't have an issue sharing information with each other the issue is that all of us all of us supposed good guys we don't want to share information with each other we don't trust. It's interesting that the criminals trust each other. We don't. So it's hard enough now from a health perspective for a lot of people to get insurance, right? Health insurance. Now, let's magnify that out to business insurance um, and to business interruption insurance uh, and the other six or seven different major types. When someone can go on to your social media and paint a picture of you and a profile of you that reflects negative, negatively towards their risk in doing business with you, that can be catastrophic for people. And what makes it even worse is if they have the legal ability or authority to now sell what they know about you to the next person. There was a, um, I can't even imagine 100 terabytes, 200 terabytes. There was a little known company last year, uh, data aggregator in Florida. Nobody's ever even heard of them. But they aggregated every different type of data you can think of. And then they uh, correlated it and stole it to all kinds of sources and people and companies that you are familiar with. Well, the aggregator company was hacked. A breach occurred. The issue here is when these profiles are being built about you or a breach occurs where the data is stolen, the part people do not understand, that company did not get breached and become a victim. That company was breached and you became the victim. You are the victim in every case. Part of the issue is the consequences don't show their face for maybe a year later, two years, three years. So this idea of social media and insurance companies working together and sharing information can hurt you and your children eight years later and you would never know why you're in the situation yeah, sure. sure when when this is all said and done love to come to new york we can all meet up somewhere and uh have a drink in front of us and have real conversation about what's going on around us and how things actually turned out